Can you imagine that this thing was built in 1937? 30, yeah, the first ones were built in 37, I think. Designed in 1933. <laughs> All the paperwork that says you're not responsible. you put a bomb drop, just any bomb drop, that bomb would open the doors. So when you're walking on this catwalk up here, which is about, uh, oh, I think it's eight inches wide. When you're walking on there, that catwalk is all you got between you and these doors that automatically open. So if you slip and fall, and of course they didn't have these platforms in there then, so <laughs> if you slip and fall, you're gone. Show us the ball gun. Okay. Right. We'll get a look at it from the outside first. Side, but they got the handles off. Probably for safety so the kid doesn't crawl yeah, in. So the kids don't crawl in or something. But anyway, this is the hatch. Okay. Okay. And that's aluminum. That's all. That's of course just aluminum and plexiglass. If you look through the front the front, if you get down there and and look in through the plate glass. Now that's thick plate glass. Okay, you see, uh, can you see anything through it? Yeah, a little bit, yep. It's kind of dirty, so it's tough. Yeah, well, if you spin this thing around and face the front, and a face in the front, and uh, he gets all that wind and dirt stuff to get sucked back up in here on day on the When you win money out, and you have to uh, clean that plate right here. And that plate was built, designed. Right here? Yeah. Okay. You, can't, you can't change the barrel in the air easily. You had to tilt the guns completely down. So your, uh, your hatch is up, that's how you get in it. And when it hatches up, then it's possible for you and a, and, a, and a waste gunner to pull those barrels out and put new barrels in, which we carry spare. But that's, if you did that, you weren't ready for the next fighter aircraft that came in. Pulled a piece of flak out of that seat, buried in that that steel seat, that long oh. from an 88. It would have uh, demanhooded me. So tell us what we're going to see, Hal. Well, I want you to see the inside of the turret, the waste guns, and 
it will have to open that hatch back here and look back in there. You can't get back here easily. But the tail gunner was almost as bad as the ball turret gunner. He kneeled it back in there. Mm. And it looks like you had two guns up on the side as well. Two the waist guns. The waist gunners, that's yeah. what you call those. And two guys, they got their backs to each other, but uh, they're not they're not directly opposite each other. The early B-17s were directly opposite, but they couldn't stay. It didn't work because if they were fighting, they were in each other's way all the time. So they moved it slightly. Yeah, 50 calibers and ammo boxes up there beside the ball. And this is the device. This is the... Ball. See, it goes in 360 degrees in both directions? All directions. All directions. You can go around and around and around. Bet you that can make you pretty dizzy. No. Out of that ammunition, you can't get up and load it. Does someone up load it for you up here? Or? Ball turret, the waist gunners have to help you. Okay. In fact, you can't get out of that ball when you're fully dressed for 60 below zero. I bet. Uh, you've been in there for five hours, six hours, uh, at high altitude. You're not getting out of there by yourself. Uh, see, when you get out, if you point the gun straight down, that hatch that we looked at, that was down here, it comes up here. And you crawl in from here, putting, standing on the seat that uh, you looked at, and then you put, I put, uh, once you got two feet on that seat, you put your butt down, sort of squeeze your legs forward, and each leg had, each foot had a control on it. And I can't remember what the left foot was. One of them was inner phone, so that your hands were completely free because your tar your gut had, your controls were up over your head. Two handles yep. with a button on the top, hmm. with a button naturally being a firing pin, firing for, for firing the guns. And uh, so you're both. You had two feet that were busy. You had two hands that were busy. And uh, your the gun's right beside your head. You notice all the insulation on the inside of this aircraft? <laughs> None. <laughs> you really have to fly in at one time to appreciate the noise level. I've been in one once. Uh, this radio room looks like it has a lot of room. That's some These are your control cables run back to your uh, tail section. Locators and your trim tabs. The thin ones are the trim tabs. The thick ones you have to listen. Yep. Was this glass when it was? Oh, uh, this. On uh, the Model G, they didn't put a gun up here. But in World War, the earlier models. But, uh, can you imagine maintaining these radios, every one of them with tubes? Mm. And the vibration mm. of this bird wouldn't be very reliable. But the reason this room is so large is because on takeoff and landing and in ditching, you had to ditch in the sea, all the people from the back of the aircraft were up here. Okay. Day rations are individual meal rations. And that side was completely full of it. This side was just our equipment. And how did the K rations taste? Were they good or bad? They weren't bad. They were the best of all the rations. I once sat at that table in Italy and listened to uh, a clear channel 700, which is Cincinnati, Ohio, on wow. a harmonic. Damn. Yeah, that belt there would hook into, go into that. But see, that whole thing moved, so. 
You weren't getting in there when the ball third gunner was operating that, that turret. Pinch your fingers you, off real you good. You didn't want to get you didn't want to get near that turret. This is a hand crank. The backup for the uh, landing gear and the flaps are manual. 600 turns wow. of that hand crank out there in the breeze. And no matter when those Bombay doors are closed, it's still breezy in there. Breezy and cold. Normal summer underwear. On top of the summer underwear, we put the winter summer underwear. On top of that, we put a summer uniform. It's a pair of khaki pants like this, uh, heavy wool socks, and a uh, uh, shirt made out of the same material. That's your summer uniform. Uh, on top of that, we put a wool suit, wool uniform, the old OD wool uniform. Uh, on top of that, we put a heated suit. This is a suit that had woven wire through it that were heated. Each position has a heated uh, a heater position to hook the suit to. Uh, is that electric heat? Electric heat. It's like an old electric blanket. Like an old electric blanket. And almost as reliable. Almost. Almost. <laughs> Except they're moving all over the place in it. And her pants and shirt and uh, boots. Uh, and then each of the boots hook to the pants, the pants hook to the shirt, the shirt hooks to the gloves. Uh, it, it's quite a contraption. Uh, then on top of that, you put your flying suit. Uh, flying suit was uh, usually a, a light, a relative, light weight, weight suit that uh, is one piece all the way. Uh, they're comfortable to wear with just a t-shirt. Uh, they're not comfortable to wear with all this other stuff. Then on top of that, you put your sheepskins, or in the later part of the war, we got uh, man-made man uh, you know, uh, outfits like we've got today. Many layered uh, nylon uh, and cotton uh, jackets with fur collars. Uh, then you tried to get into the airplane. Now, then you put a parachute harness on a May West on, under the, under the and uh, on top of all that, except for the parachute, uh, or the harness, yes, on top of all that, you put a flax suit. If you were a radio man or an engineer, I couldn't wear one. There's no way I could get it into the golf tour. These are walk-around bottles. So you could carry them with you where you went? Uh, you had to if you wanted to go from the front to the back of the aircraft. The gunner kneels in there for the whole flight and he controls. Now, my tail gunner used to sing. He was from Texas and he used to get, when he got scared, he sang New San Antonio Rose. And could you hear him all the way in there? Yeah, my co pilot would be yelling at him, shut up, we're on radio silence. <laughs> Well, no, it's got, it also can lead. He, he, the later models, he had a, that sight that could lead. It was almost a turret. Yeah. Almost. Full flight. Wow. Sometimes six hours. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, eight hour flight, but six hour, six hour in position. Six hours. On takeoff and landing, he'd be up in the radio room. Wow. To the wings of the aircraft he would fight. Okay. All right. We knew what the Fox Wolf 190 was. We knew what the Messerschmitt 109 was. The 210 was. They had to recognize and that's right. We recognize the planes. Yeah. I could, uh, we could do it because we got so many hours of that. That's part of our tra gunnery training. Every man on the crew count. Uh, and that was part of our debriefing at the end of the Day. Right, that would be the reporting at the end Part of the mission. Of it, yeah. yeah. 
The other one was how much flak we encountered, where we encountered it, right. what kind of aircraft we ran into. This may sound like a crazy question, but what 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 did you fear more, the the ground flak or the or the fighters? I didn't see too many fighters because it was 1944-45. They had been pretty much depleted. And they would they, had, they ran. We had wiped out Vanesky yeah. oil. Uh, the, the oil fields. We'd wiped out their ball bearing plants. We'd wiped out their manufacturing plants for the fighters. Uh, and they they ran out of pilots. They couldn't train them fast enough. If right. they had the aircraft, and they didn't have the aircraft. Then. Tuskegee Airmen. Tuskegee and Air. Tuskegee and Air. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go see them next next month. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, they were the best damn fighter pilots that we ever had. They say they almost never missed a rendezvous. That's right, and they never let the enemy fighters get into us. Right. They took them on before. Yeah. And uh, they were probably the best fighter groups that we ever had. And then starting in a tail, the tail gunner would say, tail gun, oxygen, okay. And at each position, in turn, going right from the tail to the nose, uh, would report, oxygen, okay. Because without oxygen, you had less than 30 seconds. Have a safe flight, guys. Thank you, gentlemen. See you again. Have a good one. Thank you, gentlemen. You must get tired of that, though. Never. Yeah, if I get. I flew with him two years ago. Oh, did you? Yeah. Yeah. God bless you. And yeah. They're a great bunch of guys, they're all volunteers. I know my great uncle flew. He, he, he wasn't a pilot on one, but he got shot down in a B-17 with a bloody hundredth over the, uh, on his 14th mission. I only flew 13, but I flew in uh, 1949. Not, you're talking about 1943. Yeah. Yeah. He was a ball turret gunner too, but his, his brain was pretty well. Used oh, up. There you go. Number two. That's where the generator is. Now he's got electricity. Now he can start the rest of it. Number three's also got a battery in general. That's a sequence I learned in 1943.